Okay. So today we have a pleasure to have uh, Professor uh, Christian Morel from Ex Marseille University. He's also um, a colleague from my lab, and he's teaching um, essentially uh, um, applications uh, towards medicine, mostly uh, from detectors that were first designed for for particle physics. So um, I leave uh, the mic to him. Okay, uh, do you hear me? So thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about uh, a challenge we try to set up on what I call the mythic uh, 10 picosecond frontier for time of flight positron emission tomography. So I, I will try to explain you uh, what is positron emission tomography and maybe a little bit about history of medical imaging. Uh, in parallel, I've opened the, the, the chat window. So if you have any question, you can ask it either in English or in French, if you like. And I, I might try to, to interrupt or try to answer you during the talk. All right, then if we go back to the uh, foundation of medical imaging, we certainly can go back to the end of the 19th century with, of course, the discovery of the X-rays by uh, Röntgen, uh, for which he got the first uh, historical Nobel Prize in 1901. And very soon after the discovery in, 1984, uh, in 1894 of the, the X-rays, Röntgen started to do radiography, and you can see here a picture of his uh, wife's hand that was taken on the 22nd of December 1895 and published in the New York Times on the 16th of uh, January next year. And that was really the very start of the spread out of uh, radiology uh, all over the world. And, uh, even the, the year after, in 1897, the first uh, radiological institute was opened and, and founded by uh, Antoine Beclair at the Hôpital Tenon in Paris. Uh, and you can, you can see here on the side the way uh, physicians were performing uh, what we now call the, the radioscopy uh, with that women here. And you have here an X-ray tube, which was irradiating both the women and the doctor as well. And was really doing a scopy with a fluorescent screen, looking at the, the lungs of the lady in real time, so to say. And after that, uh, on, on the left side, uh, you can see a picture of a woman here in a, a small van. That was a small uh, uh, Renault van which was called the, the Petite Curie in 1916 uh, during the First World War. And the person who is sitting here is Marie Curie itself. And she grounded with about 32 uh, Petite Curie in order to bring uh, X-ray uh, radiographs directly on the battlefield to cure the, the soldiers that were wounded. And then I will do a large step uh, up to the 60s with the rediscovery by Alan Cormack of a solution that was explaining how to reconstruct an object from his, uh, its parallel projections that was originally uh, uh, published by Radon in uh, 1917. And Alan, uh, Alan uh, Cormack, who was working at the University of Cap in South Africa, uh, re re rediscovered that method and published it in two uh, famous papers. And together with uh, Sir Godfrey Hounsfield, he got the Nobel Prize of Medicine in uh, 1979 for the invention and, and uh, the discovery of the computed X-ray tomography. And you can see here one of the first uh, 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 brain scans that was- uh, Christian, before you go further, yeah. there is a question on the chat that uh, yeah. uh, Kola has, maybe he wants to ask. Yeah. Oh, I, I, just, I just noticed something strange on uh, um, uh, 
on the, on the left X-ray side. image. Yeah. Um, so I you want me maybe... to go back to to the picture? Yeah, so what... there's this bulge by a, by a, I think it's a it's yeah. A, this a is the ring actually. This is, a, okay, so we didn't. The ring it's, of Mrs. Renton. <laughs> it's just a proof that it is wife. Yeah. Yeah, so her name was Bertha, Bertha Okay, thanks. Okay, so I go back where I was. So this is one of the first historical brain scans that was performed with uh, X-ray computer, computed tomography or computerized tomography, the CT scan. And that was performed by, directly by Hansfield and, and Mr. Ambrose at the Atkinson Morley Hospital in 1971, uh, about right, uh, like today, that was the first of uh, October in 1971. And then this was presented, the, the picture was made, the scan was made in Greek secret, and it was presented to the Royal Society, uh, Society of, uh, of uh, Medicine in, in Brittany. And for this, uh, development, both uh, Hansfield and Cormac got uh, Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology uh, for this. So when you are looking inside anything by doing any type of radiology, it depends on the, the media you are using to go through the object, which can be either a solid object or a patient, of course. And here you see two, two pictures. Uh, with one picture on the left, which is a typical X-ray of uh, a small uh, sculpture of Buddha. And you see exactly the same sculpture, which is done here with neutron radiography. And you see that depending on the type of media going through the object, you get different type of information, of course. With neutron, you, you get information about the way neutron interacts into matter especially with uh, organic parts that contains a lot of hydrogen, which is not the case uh, with X-rays, for which you get information about the density of the object that, it tra that is uh, traversed by uh, the, the medium. So uh, it is important to understand that in medical imaging, you can do plenty of different types of medical images by using different me media to go through the object. And one of the media was related to the uh, theoretical uh, postulation of the existence of holes by uh, Dirac in 1930, he got the Nobel Prize in 33 for that, and the subsequent discovery of the, the anti-electron, uh, the positron, that was performed by uh, Carl Anderson at Berkeley uh, in 1932. And he got also the Nobel Prize in 1936 for the uh, discovery of the positron, which is a positive electron, so known as the antiparticle of the electron. And this is a cliche here uh, of uh, the picture that was done in an emulsion where there was a magnetic field which is going through my screen from top to bottom. And, and then the particle had to go through a small lead piece. You can see here in, in black. And you see obviously that the particle is, is going from down, going up to the upper part of the image because of the radius, which is uh, much more curved up uh, on the top side of the lead, and knowing the direction of the of the magnetic field, you can see that the electric charge of that particle is certainly positive, and corresponding to the same behavior as an electron, but but with a positive charge. And when uh, an electron uh, uh, makes a, a meeting meets a positron. It happens a well-known reaction, which is an annihilation reaction, where all the energy which is contained in the rest mass of the particle is transformed in purely radiative energy in the forms of two annihilation photons, then go, uh, which go back to back uh, in the same uh, direction, but opposite sides, as you can see in this 
small animation. So what you see also is that the, the positron and the electron has to meet uh, almost at, at rest in the, the frame of the laboratory, which means that the positron, when it, when it is emitted through the radioactive decay of some radioisotopes, will first lose its energy, have a short range before it can annihilate with uh, an electron of the body of the patient. And resulting from that, you get a pair of annihilation photons. And with both these photons, for uh, the law of conservation of energy and momentum, have to go back to back with the same energy corresponding to the rest mass of the electron or of the positron, which is the same, and which is 511 uh, keV. This is exactly the, an exemplary, uh, an illustration of the famous uh, law from Einstein, which is E egal mc square, of course. So this is used in positron emission tomography the following way. By using a ring of detector, you will be able to detect uh, simultaneous emission of 511 keV photons, which we call annihilation photons. By doing this, uh, this coincident measurement you, have an, you get an information that there has been some annihilation on the way of the two annihilation photons. You don't know where it is. You don't know if it is here or there or, or here, but you know that for sure it is somewhere along the line which is driven by the two annihilation photons. So detecting two photons at the same time gives you a kind of electronic collimation of uh, the direction of the photons. You can define this common direction and the information as, is that there is some, some, something along this line. Of course, you don't know where. So by summing up a number of uh, coincident detection along this line, what you go, uh, what you will do is you will sum all the annihilation points which are staying on this line and by doing this sum, you, die, you do what we call in mathematics a projection operation. So you build with all the association of the uh, detection channels uh, by pair, you can build a set of all the projection of the annihilation distribution points in every direction around the patient. And this is used exactly like you are using uh, X-ray projection to do computerized uh, tomography. So you will do computerized tomography, but with the projection measured uh, with annihilation photons. That's the basic principle of positron emission tomography. And for getting positron, you will, you will use isotopes where there is one neutron missing as compared to the stable isotopes. And you can find, for instance, that oxygen 15 with one neutron less as compared to oxygen 16, you get a transformation of this nuclei by uh, changing a proton into a new neutron to get a stable element of fluorine 18, actually. And this oxygen 15 is used to decay and give you emission of positron. Same as for uh, azot 13 or carbon 11 or fluorine 18, which is the working horse of positron emission tomography. So all of these. Uh, so, sorry, can I please? I, can you please just explain again how you get a like, emission of positrons from your, your, your the, these isotopes? So these isotopes are, are neutron deficient isotopes. So you see that in oxygen 15. There is one neutron missing as compared to oxygen 16. Yeah. So the way is that naturally this isotope is radioactive and we do what we call a, a beta plus decay. That is to say uh, a transformation of the flavor inside the nucleus of a proton into a neutron. And this is not a proton decay. This is really a, a beta plus decay of the nucleus itself where you will go from the oxygen uh, 15 to the element with uh, nine proton instead of, of six, of eight, sorry. 
And this new element is the fluorine, of course. So the oxygen-15 through the beta plus decay, that is the emission of a positron with some uh, neutrino, there is a and particularly Dunsey together with it, which is a neutrino, will transform to a fluorine, a, a fluorine uh, isotope, which is stable. And the half-life of oxygen-15 is two minutes. Uh, same as for the uh, as a 13 with 10 minute half lives, the carbon 11 with 20 minutes, or the fluorine 18 uh, with 120, about two hours, 110 minutes. So all these isotopes are decaying through emitting positron, and they can be uh, they can be used to label uh, radio pharmaceutical products as for instance, the, the mostly used um, tracer for positron emission tomography is a kind of sugar whose name is fluorodeoxyglucose, which is labeled by uh, a fluorine 18 atom you see here in yellow. So you can really have plenty of different uh, types of radio pharmaceuticals labeling different uh, metabolic pathway and depending if you are using a sugar or a neurotransmitter or uh, uh, something which is related to DNA, you can follow different types of metabolism where you will look, thanks to the decay of the radioactive isotope, the distribution of the annihilation points, which gives you an information of the uptake of the radio pharmaceutical products. For instance, if you are using a sugar, you will look at the way the, the body is consuming sugar, that is uh, everything which is related to the glucose metabolism by the brain, by the heart, or by any infla inflammatory uh, uh, inflammation into the body. So the principle of doing uh, a reconstruction of the image from the information you get from a projection is to, to do the inverse operation of projecting, which is back projecting. So as you don't know when you have a projection from which parts of the projection comes the uh, constituting parts of the projections, the only thing you can do is to act demo democratically that is to say, to spread the content of the projection all along the pixel that were in the projection direction. For instance, if you have a projection of a, of a cylindrical uh, uh, object, you get something, you can back project along a direction of projection and you do it for all the direction of projection. So now if you have two direction, you get this, if you have eight, direction of projection will get that and so forth. And little by little, you start to see uh, appearing the object itself that was a cylinder for which you measured all the projection all around the object. Um, that's the principle of back projection. But what you see as well is that um, the projection was a projection of a, a cylindrical of uh, uniform density, let's say. And what you see is that the, the profile of the cylinder, once being back, back projected from its projections, is not uniform at all. And even the, 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 the edge of the cylinder is not really sharp. You have some, some gray here, you can see. So this is related to the fact that the simple back projection is not the uh, inverse operation of the projection and you need to do more than that. And actually, uh, you have different ways to represent an object. The uh, mostly uh, evident uh, way to represent an object of this ellipsis, for instance, is to represent it on the direct space, which is what you, your A is looking at. And when you see that, you see, okay, this is an ellipse. You see directly what it is. You can, you can also represent it into a frequency space where on the X axis and on the Y axis, you, re, we, you will represent the uh, spatial frequency along the X axis and the spatial frequency along the X 
the y-axis. Of course, the operation which allow you to go from one representation to the other one is what we call the Fourier transform. And going back from the frequency space to the Dirac space is simply the fact of applying an inverse Fourier transform, which is really very easy to do. If you do a projection, uh, you will represent the same object in a projection space, space where all the line in this space corresponds to one projection in one direction, sorry. So you have one projection in the vertical direction here, for instance, in the top, and on the bottom, you get the other projections in the other um, uh, sense and for the same directions. And you measure on this projection space, you get all the projections in all the directions all around the ellipsis in 2D space. So the transform, the mathematical transform, which explains how you go from the direct space to the projection space in two dimension is what we call the Acer, the Radon transform, or the X-ray transform. This is not true if you're going to project a volume. In, if you're going to project a volume, you get the X-ray transform and not the radon transform of the volume. And then the problem of uh, doing inverse uh, tomography, which is doing uh, image reconstruction tomography, is to go from the projection space back to the direct space, which basically you will perform by using a back projection. But uh, one can show that there is some intimate relationship between the projection space and the frequency space. And the idea is that if you consider one projection into one direction here along this axis T, uh, I've plot here the projection of this ellipse here with the hole. If you perform the Fourier space representation of that, in, in spatial uh, frequency, you can demonstrate very easily that the frequency representation of that projection is the same as the frequency representation of the image, but only along this um, frequency axis. That is to say that if you sample all the projection, actually you will sample the Fourier space of the object but using a polar uh, coordinate system in the Fourier space and not a Cartesian coordinate system. And you're going to use this information, which indicates you, to, you do oversampling for low frequency and undersampling at high frequency to filter the projection with an appropriate filtering to restore the same measurement weight for any frequency. This filter is, actually, is given exactly by the absolute value of the frequency or the norm of the frequency, uh, and then back project this filtered uh, project. And this is the name of the algorithm that was rediscovered by Alan Cormack in Le Cap, in the Cape Town in South Africa, uh, that was originally published by Radon in 1917, which is called, which is called the uh, filtered back projection algorithm. That's the basis of image reconstruction in tomography. And just as an example, I show you here, uh, Acer on the left or on the right, images of the same uh, projections, once uh, simply back, project, back projecting without filtering, and on the right side, the same back projection, but, uh, but only after uh, having filtered the projection with the appropriate filter. So you see that using the filter with rest will, is going to restore and give you the right weight for any, uh, any frequency, which gives you the right uh, contrast into the image. This is a little bit of magic, but it goes like this. So the way a tomograph is, is working, imagine that you, you get here, uh, a radioactive source that is emitting uh, annihilation pairs. And imagine you will, you will detect an annihilation pairs on this yellow line here between these two detectors. Then you don't know where 
the annihilation occurs. You know, it's some, 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 somewhere along this yellow line. And if you consider a set of parallel yellow line, you can build up with associating by associating pairs of detectors, you can build a projection of uh, this source in the direction of the yellow line. So what you do is you're going to represent this yellow line by its distance to the origin and a polar angle here, phi, on a projection space here with the radial coordinate here as the abscissa and the polar angle, the azimutal angle, sorry, as the uh, ordinate system. Once you have done that, a parallel set of projection line will appear as a horizontal line into the projection space. And then you can consider a different line with a different uh, azimutal angle. And what you see is you will fill different lines. And the image into the projection space of the source here that was in red is this curve, which is a sine curve. This is why we call this projection space also the sinogram space or the sinogram of the object. So this is a sinogram you can get. So when I see a simple sinogram here like this red curve, I can imagine that this is the image of uh, a point source as it is here. And that when the sinogram is like this one, I need to proceed to tomographic inversion in order to reconstruct the image. And this is what is done here. So on the left side, you see the direct representation of the object, we see, which is a Deraso phantom that allows you to look at the spatial resolution of uh, an imaging system of a PET scanner here. And on the right side, this is the sinogram space, the projection space. This is exactly what you get out of the PET scanner as a information. So historically, this idea to use uh, electronic collimation from uh, the annihilation between an electron and a positron was postulated uh, shortly after the 30s, during the 50s. And you can see here on the image, a first attempt to build the PET scanner. Of course, uh, one had no idea at the time uh, how to do a tomography with that, because if you remember it well, the rediscovery and the, the invention of CT, uh, X-ray CT uh, was done during uh, the late uh, 60s and uh, the beginning of the 70s. So people at the Brookhaven, uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory on the Long Island in New York, in near New York, they built that system with 32 uh, sodium iodide detector uh, coupled with uh, a photomultiplier tube here. So you have the sodium iodide there and the PMTs here and then the electronics there, all around the head of this woman with the intent to maybe uh, see what she was thinking. And they called it the hair dryer. That was one of the first attempts to build uh, a positron emission tomograph scanner. Uh, now, if you look at uh, more recent stuff, this is a typical PET scanner, which looks like uh, an electromagnetic uh, calorimeter. This is uh, an ECAT exact HR plus that was built by CTI uh, PET system in Knoxville in 1995. So you have a ring of detector blocks that is surrounding the patients and able to, to, to measure uh, in all associated uh, combination between the detector, uh, annihilation uh, between electron and positrons. So there was a continuous uh, improvement in PET instrumentation. And I, I show you here different brain scan and you can see the improvement in the accuracy of the scans during the years from all these systems that were built in Knoxville, Tennessee uh, by CTI PET systems 
um, starting in 1975 with a PET-3 scanner down to the ECATEXAT HR Plus, I should just show you before. And all these scanners are built uh, by using um, scintillation detector based on uh, inorganic uh, scintillators. Most, mostly at start, they were using sodium iodide. And then the ECAT exact is, is built using uh, bismuth germanate crystals, BGO. And nowadays, scanners are mostly built by using uh, lutetium or lutetium and yttrium uh, oxyorthosilicate, LSO or LYSO. So this is why all these type of detector, BGO and LSO, are very dense and able to have the 511 keV gamma rays interacting into it in order to be detected. And they, uh, the, the precision in timing for this detector basically relates on the speed of the emission of the scintillation light into the, the detector. And this speed is related to the, the decay of, of some trap inside the scintillator. And this decay time, the faster it is, the best it is. And you see that for BGO, it's, it's about 300 nanoscans, which is not very good. I put it in red. Whereas for LYSO, that was developed in the late 90s, uh, this is about 10 times faster. And this is the reason why nowadays one is using LSO uh, and not BGO to build uh, PET scanners. The so light yield also is important which is the number of uh, visible photons, scintillation photon you will get per unit of energy deposited by, by the gamma rays inside the crystal. And the more important it is, the better it is in order to have a good energy resolution and a good timing resolution for the detector. So you can see that there has been uh, progress in plenty of fields. You see here, for instance, in red, uh, the, the emission of light into uh, LSO as compared to BGO, which is that flat curve here, which is very, very, very slow, 300 nanoseconds, compared to the sharp uh, LSO light emission, which is much better to have uh, precision with time uh, when you measure the arrival time of uh, annihilation photon. And this precision in time, in time is very important because you want to associate the detection of 511 uh, annihilation photon, 511 kV annihilation photon together to form a coincident event. And this is thanks to the precision of this time, uh, this measurement of time, of arrival time into the detector. So there have been a number of progress in the detectors, in data correction, and as well, uh, in image reconstruction algorithm. You see here for the same data, uh, the type of image you can get by using filtered back projection, basically. And nowadays, one is more using uh, uh, what we call statistical reconstruction or iterative reconstructions. So um, to see the development, you, you remember this famous hair dryer with only 32 big sodium iodide crystal coupled with PMTs. Here you have one of the most elaborate uh, high resolution research tomographs that was built in Knoxville with 153,000 uh, 600 crystals connected to 1,120 PMTs. Um, this is a type of image you can get out of this uh, research tomograph that was dedicated to brain study. And today, the, the most elaborate PET scanner uh, result from a project that was uh, shared between the Penn State University and the uh, University of California in Davis, as well as uh, the Berkeley Lab, uh, close to San Francisco, to build a, what we call a total body scanner. That is a scanner that will cover the full body of the patient. And 
one of the principal uh, objective of this project was really to improve the solid angle of the system, that is the, the efficiency of the system for detecting 5.11 uh, kV uh, annihilation photons in order to get a sensitivity uh, that will be improved by a factor of about 40 as compared to uh, typical uh, clinical scanners. Uh, and this improvement in, in sensitivity will reduce in an improvement of, of limiting the dose, that is the quantity of radioactivity that is administered to the patient, uh, which will be comparable, let's, to, uh, let's say, to what the dose you will get if you fly from uh, San Francisco to London Heathrow, um, if you do a, a transatlantic flight. So you can see here a picture of this explorer. Uh, so you have all the crystal buckets here. Now you get the number of 564,480 crystal for, uh, and they are not anymore connected to uh, photomultiplier tubes, but we are using new types of photodetectors to read out the scintillation light, which are named the silicon photomultipliers. And this system has more than 63,000 SIPM. So you see a picture of the device here. And the first image that were obtained at the Shanghai Hospital in China uh, of a very short scan. Here you see one minute scan that was made uh, 81 minutes after the injection. And, or a 20 minute scan. And this is really very, very impressive due to the improvement of the sensitivity of the system. Uh, besides this, uh, there had been since the, the late 90s, the idea to uh, combine together a PET scanner and X-ray CT scanner in order to, to have both uh, information from the PET metabolism through the uh, radio pharmaceutical products. And uh, uh, close to it, you will have an X-ray source here and an X-ray detector there in order to do a CT, a CT scan, which will give you information about the, the anatomy of the patient, the bone structure and so forth. And that was resulting uh, from an idea of Dave Townsend who was working at the Geneva University Hospital uh, in relation to CERN, uh, where he, he, he has built with CERN this uh, prototype here, uh, which was called the partial ring prototype that was rotating on the gantry, uh, giving the first prototype named prototype uh, rotating tomograph. So this prototype had mostly was developed in order to, to provide cost-effective PET scanner with the idea to, to give ac access to, to PET imaging as well to, to poor countries, like uh, uh, for instance in Africa. And these empty spaces here uh, gave him the idea to develop a PET CT scanner, which he did. Uh, in Pittsburgh, in the United States, he left Geneva to go to Pittsburgh and built together with Siemens and CTI PET system in Knoxville, one of the first PET CT scanners uh, where you can superimpose the PET image here, which is uh, this, this uh, yellow part here, which is an accumulation of the fluorodeoxyglucose uh, in a metastasis, in a tumor. And you can see that the tumor, thanks to the anatomical information, is clearly inside the bone structure here of the spine. So this is Dave Townsend here. You see here, I mean, he got the doctora honoris causa from the University of Marseille here. Uh, this guy here in purple is, uh, was the former president of our university. And the first uh, PET CT image got the was declared the invention of the years from the Time magazine again, like for Rengen, in December 2000, with the, the motto one plus one equal to three. That is one tap image plus one uh, 
X-ray CT image is more than the sum of both. So the first commercial PET CT scanner was then insta installed in 2001 in Zurich by General Electric. And in 2005, more than 650 TEP CT scanners were installed. About 95% of the PET cells. You see then that most of the PET scanner now are PET CT scanner. You cannot buy any more uh, PET scanner alone. And you see here in, in, in um, violet here, you, you get the TEP only scanner. And in purple, it's a PET CT scanner. So the current market is only related to PET CT scanner, except from the Explorer we were discussing here. So you can image uh, human beings, and like for instance, this image on the right that was obtained with the ECAT Exat HR plus scanner uh, by injecting fluoride deoxyglucose. So you see the brain here, the heart, the vessel, the bladder, sorry. And you, you can do the same with the mouse uh, by doing what we call preclinical image, where you see the mouse is a, about the same as a human being with a heart and a bladder. Of course, the mass is, is uh, about uh, 2,000 times uh, smaller than a human, and you will inject much less activity into it. But you can use uh, functional imaging through positron emission tomography in order, for instance, to help in developing new drugs uh, and, and doing animal imaging, small animal imaging, without having to to sacrifice uh, the animals after each trial. You can follow up uh, longitudinally a long time. So we, we just took up with, uh, took over with this idea of to do a, a PET CT. And this is what we did here in Marseille, where, sorry, we have a PET CT scanner, uh, where the, the, the PET detector here is, built of small, tiny pixels, two by two by eight millimeters of LSO and two types of, of scintillating crystal, LSO and LUIAP, in a, in a structure which we call a phosphor sandwich or a phosphorus structure read out by a multi-anode PMT. And this is what you see here. And that was mounted here with an X-ray tube here, an X-ray detector there, and the PET detector on both sides. And this is rotating on this structure here on the left continuously in order to produce PET CT image of mouse, as you can see here, where you see a slice through the heart of the mouse. And this is the heart of the mouse here. You have another slice here. You see the head of the mouse. And this is a 3D rendering where the orange part corresponds to the X-ray image, so the bone structure. And the other bright part corresponds to uh, the functional image of the uh, fluorodeoxyglucose by positron emission uh, tomography. You see the tongue here. You see what we call the Hazarian gland, which are glands behind the eyes for rats and mouse. And you see the, the heart here. And in between the shoulders here, this is what we call the, the, the gray, um, grease, which is kind of uh, energy reserve for the mouse. So again, I'm going back to the idea of doing back projection for reconstruction. And I want to introduce another, another point about this reconstruction, which is, which is related to the counting statistics. So you see that if I will back project, let's say 100 uh, annihilations, or a thousand or 10,000 and so forth, you get more and more, more precise image with less noise. So you see that there are two things with an image. On one side, you get the uh, spatial resolution of the image. And on the other side, you get the signal to noise ratio in the uh, reconstructed image boxes. And image um, signal to noise ratio is very important because this is what you can recover for doing a precise measurement, what we call a quantification of 
uh, radiopharmaceutical uptake. And this is clearly related to the statistics, you, the number of annihilation pairs you will have uh, been able to detect. So just to give you an idea of this dependent on the statistics, if you want to measure, let's say the activity, which is the signal you want to measure, the radioactivity, the activity of the radio pharmaceutical. And you want to measure the signal to noise ratio on the activity, which will be the activity divided by the error on the activity. Basically, this is a counting experiment, which is, this is related to the number of annihilation, um, positron emission you will get into your voxel. Uh, if you have a Poisson uh, distribution, then the uh, signal to noise ratio goes like uh, the square root of the number of counts. Therefore, uh, the number of counts will go like the square of the signal to noise ratio. Then if for each one of the voxel, you sum up all these voxel, so you will get, let's say if you have voxel of size small d for a length of measurements, uh, which is caps L, the number of voxels along this line will be uh, caps L divided by small d and you take it to the cubic power because you have a volume measurement. And then the number, the total number of annihilation you will have to get a signal to noise ratio of A divided by uh, delta A uh, have to be multiplied by the number of voxel you get along a line of response. This is because you are measuring projections and not directly what is, what not directly the content of one of these voxels. You measure the sum up of the content of all the voxels lying on this line. So therefore you see that if you want to improve the spatial resolution of the image, let's say that is to, to use uh, smaller voxels by a factor two, if you want to get with the smaller voxel the same signal to noise ratio, you will, you will have to increase the total statistic by a factor 16, which show you that tomography is very demanding in uh, photon statistics, in counting statistics in order to, to, to get uh, the wanted signal to noise ratio into the reconstructed voxels. Now, if we go back to the measurement and the determination of an annihilation, you have a, an annihilation that occurs here on this yellow part. You will get two annihilation photons going back to back. One will be detected here at T1, and the other one will be detected on the other side at T2. Then if you do the difference of detection time, T2 minus T1, you see that the position of this yellow annihilation from the center of this red line is proportional to T2 minus T1. This is what we call a time of flight measurement. Of course, if you would like to be able to measure with high precision the position of the yellow spot here, let's say with a precision of about a millimeter and a half, then it means that you would have to be able to measure this time difference of detection with a precision on this time difference, which should be of about 10 picosecond, because you know, the speed of light at uh, the level of human being is that a, a photon will take uh, one nanoseconds to go from this part of my shoulder to my other shoulder. So the speed of light is about 30, 30 centimeter per nanosecond. So then of course, getting 10 picosecond uh, energy uh, time resolution on a coincidence measurement is very difficult. But if you could get some precision on, of this time difference measurement, then you could, you could use this time of flight measurement in order 
to uh, back project the value you will have counted, not all along the line of response, like it is done on the top here, but only for those pixels that are located close to the time difference measurement, plus or minus the error, which is defined by the time resolution of the detector. And this is a principle of time of flight reconstruction. And from that time of flight reconstruction, instead of multiplying the number of uh, counts you, uh, you need to get, the number of annihilation uh, detection you need to get uh, in coincidence, you will have simply to multiply by the number of pixels that are along this resolution, which is provided by the time resolution of uh, the coincidence. Where C here is the speed of light, 30 centimeter per nanosecond. And by doing that, you get a kind of uh, variance reduction factor where the precision of the image you're going to get will have a better signal to noise ratio. And this is directly proportional to uh, the, the precision uh, you can get on the uh, measurement of the difference of time of detection of the annihilation pair. And this is what you can see here on this uh, simulated image that was the thesis of uh, uh, Mrs. Groisel at the University uh, of Massachusetts in Worcester, where you get here a reconstruction without time of flight information with a time of flight information of 700 picosecond, 500 picosecond, and here on the right, only 300 picosecond. You see the clear improvement in signal to noise ratio. You can see more precisely the hotspots here on this image with uh, 300 picosecond time of flight uh, reconstruction that without using time of flight. So again, there is the same statistics of counting for the, the reconstruction of all these image, except you are using time of flight information with a better and better precision. So you see the effect of including this time of flight information in order to improve the signal to noise ratio into the image for the same uh, counting statistics. And thanks to uh, basically the invention of uh, silicon photo photomultipliers, we are able now to get uh, scanners with state-of-the-art scanners, basically the, the biograph vision from Siemens with a time of flight uh, precision in coincidence of 210 picosecond. And you see here again the improvement of uh, a typical uh, phantom reconstruction without time of flight. And then with uh, MCT uh, about uh, five years ago with uh, 527 picosecond time of flight uh, resolution. And you see the net improvement when you go down to 210 uh, picosecond time of flight. Now then, uh, of course, to improve time of flight uh, measurement, you need to improve the timing performance of the detector. So I will not go into detail at that step, uh, but you can find different transparencies in my uh, presentation. And for the sake of time, I will directly uh, go to this slide here. Can you see my slide? I can yes. see. Them. Okay, thanks. So we can ask us, and I'm almost finished, what would happen if you would uh, be able to reconstruct uh, images by using detector with a 10 picosecond time of flight uh, resolution? And so 10 picosecond, as I said, provides you a positioning of the annihilation position with a resolution of about 1.5 millimeter. And here, what uh, this is work that was done at uh, Leuven by Johan Meitz. Uh, he took very large detector with uh, a, a spatial resolution of five millimeter only. So 
much worse than what you can get into the image. So this is a true activity here he wanted to reconstruct. And this is a typical back projection you get without filtering, simply back projecting the projection uh, without using time of flight. Then you can a little bit improve this by uh, incorporating statistical information and performing a kind of type of uh, uh, likelihood maximization. But still without time of flight information. Now, if you back project simply uh, the data, but only within the plus or minus 1.5 millimeter provided by 10 picosecond uh, uh, timing resolution, this is the image you can get. And this image here is performed without tomographic inversion, so to say, it's simply the back projection of the data. And if you then include on top of that statistical information, this is the image you get. So you can see that going to this mythic frontier of 10 picosecond, you could really have image reconstruction almost uh, without having uh, to do image reconstruction tomography. You will get, get directly the image. So this is why a few years ago, um, I, I was really amazed by, by, I don't know if you remember that uh, challenge that was reigned by the uh, Inter International uh, Aeronautic uh, Federation for the first balloon who will succeed to do a circumnavigation of the globe. And there had been really several tentatives by, by different people like uh, Brian Jones and, uh, and others to, to try to win this challenge. And after several tentatives, uh, in March 1999, Brian Jones and Bertrand Picard succeed to do it. And they, by with the orbiter um, three, they, they went round the earth in 90 days, one hour and 49 minutes. And they won the Budweiser Cup with that, which was about $1 million, not much. And thinking to that, I, I made the point that was maybe a clear cut case to shed light on time of flight pet uh, with uh, coincidence time resolution smaller than pic 10 picosecond uh, full width as half maximum to raise a challenge on reconstructionless positron emission tomography. Uh, as you may know, Bertrand Picard is the grandson of Auguste Picard, and this is Auguste Picard, a famous, I'm sure you know him, He's a, he was a famous physicist, he was Swiss, but a professor at the University in Brussels. And he was one of the first performing a stratos stratospheric balloon flight uh, in, during the 30s. And I, I'm sure you know him because uh, Hergé took him as a, uh, the example to, to develop his Trifon tournesol in Tintin in Tintin. So uh, the idea to set up a challenge in order to improve uh, technological performance of uh, of apparatus is not new and actually one of the first challenges that was raised was uh, the fact of the British Parliament uh, in 1714 for the Longitude Act uh, that was raised after, after the shipwreck of uh, a boat on the reefs of uh, Gilston uh, after the, they were going back from Toulon uh, during the 18th century. Um, during a battle between the, 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 the French and the English people. And they, they raised uh, the Longitude Act and they also grounded the office, uh, the Longitude Office in Greenwich uh, and offered a reward to anybody who would find a simple and practical way to determine precisely the longitude of a ship with different reward uh, depending on the precision. And that was won by Mr. Harrison with this construction of here of the first marine chronometer. At start, when they raised the challenge, they didn't thought it would be a problem of uh, making precise timing measurement. Uh, they were mostly thinking about some more better use of uh, stars and uh, astronomical observations. 
And then if you go to our, to the past century in 1919, Mr. Ortega offered a prize for the first flight uh, across the Atlantic, who was uh, won, as you know, by Charles Lindbergh in 1927 for the first flight from New York to Paris. And you see here the spirit of Saint Louis and Charles Lindbergh receiving the prize um, from Mr. Ortega. And more recently, you can find all the prize from the X Prize Foundation, which is a foundation in California uh, that was grounded as an innovation engine, engine a facilitator of uh, exponential change. And it is based in California, as I said, and it is funding several prizes in plenty of domains like life science, uh, environment, and so forth. And uh, there is a, a board of this uh, X Prize Foundation with Elon Musk, James Cameron, uh, people very famous people like Larry Page, Anna Huffington, Britain Tata. Uh, were all members of the Anim Administration Council. For instance, they, they set up in 2020 the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize with $10 million uh, in order to, to develop a system to do plenty of uh, type of monitoring for the human, like cardiac monitoring, oxygen, and so forth. And they won the, the prize. Uh, the prize was won by Qualcomm. I do not Tricorder is the name of a famous scanner in the USS Ship Enterprise in Star Trek. So uh, with a number of friends, we took this idea to try to raise a new challenge, which is called the 10 picosecond challenge, uh, with the idea to, 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 to fund two prizes on the way of the development of very, very high precise uh, coincidence time machine. Uh, first, with the Flash Gordon Prize. As you know, Flash Gordon has uh, this type of logo with two, uh, two lightning going back and back to back, like an annihilation purse. And then there will be, there will be a second prize, uh, which we call Learn on Mac Prize, for the first team who will succeed to reconstruct only by using uh, time of flight information. Uh, the mini rods of uh, resolution phantom uh, with a pet uh, prototype. And Leonard McCoy, just to say, to fix the things, was uh, is a physician of the USS Enterprise in Star Trek as well. So there has been a paper uh, which has just been published very recently, which is a roadmap towards the 10 picosecond time of flight challenge you can access on the, in physics, in medicine, and biology. And being able to do fast timing uh, will also uh, have other applications than in time of flight uh, positron emission tomography, for instance, for Compton imaging, for proton therapy range monitoring or also for positron annihilation lifetime spectroscopy, which is used to study uh, uh, um, metals and different types of material science, or for uh, the LIDAR system for light detection and ranging. So you can access the description of the challenge on this uh, website here, the 10 picosecond Picosecond challenge, the 10 picosecond challenge.org. And I thank you very much for your listening, and I'm, I'm ready to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christian, for this uh, very nice um, lecture. I don't know if you have uh, questions. I, I don't see questions in the chat box. But please, if you have questions, just uh, um, go ahead one by one. We are not so so many connected, so. Uh, maybe Christian can explain to uh, the participants uh, why uh, improving the resolution is uh, is is, uh, is is a good idea. And, 
You you mean the the time resolution? The time resolution, yes. Yes. So I, I will go back to the first page of my. Uh, let me share again um, my screen. If I go back to this um, to the first slide of my my presentation, sorry. Uh, you see that uh, if you would be able to measure the time difference very precisely, you see that uh, the distance to the center of this line of response, this red line here, is directly proportional to this time difference uh, T2 minus T1, because of the speed of light is a constant, right? So if you would be able to measure it uh, with an infinite precision, then you will not have to, to go through uh, tomographic inversion. You will directly get the position of the annihilation points through it. Now, if you are not able to measure this time difference with high precision, but with a, a certain precision, instead, instead of doing an image reconstruction by back projecting information on all the pixels along the red line, you will be able to restrict the back projection only for those pixels that are close to the measurement given by T2 minus T1 plus or minus an error. And this restriction here will improve uh, the usage you are doing of the, the measurement and it will in the end improve the signal to noise ratio in the reconstructed image. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. Other questions? So I'm going to, to look at the, the chat as well. So if you want to ask question, even in French, you can. Maybe one in French, if you want. <laughs> so sorry. Okay. So my name is Christine, Christine Darfumet, normally. So one quick question, actually thinking, because you we're showing a lot of the process, which I think are so important for medical and for imaging. Now, is there any capacity as well for this artificial intelligence to be as well implemented within um, the current development or the current study that you are ongoing? Is it something that is also what CNRS is doing? So the, the, we are using uh, deep learning in order to, for instance, understand how the uh, scintillation light is emitted in a crystal and mostly to, to be able to, to reconstruct precisely the position and, and time <coughs> phase space into that crystal, of course. So deep learning would allow, I think, to improve uh, the, the measurement performance of the device in right. terms of both the, the spatial uh, resolution, so positioning of the interaction point into the crystal and the timing as well. To do resolution and the timing. So like this, you can really yeah. get yeah. as well more relevant. Then, then I'm not sure that on the side of image reconstruction, it, it would be much helpful, but there are plenty of uh, work that is done also for uh, tomographic inversion by using deep learning systems. Or the deep learning, so that's yeah. good, good to know. Other questions? The students, don't be shy. Just go ahead and ask your question. If you want to ask in French, it's, it's okay. Amy Topé, raise her hand. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you Hello. very much for the lecture. I would like to ask a question on the formula that was shown during the presentation. Yeah. There was one that was raised to, I don't know, maybe you should help me with the slide so I can ask my question. Um, there was a formula A over L about, yes. This one, yeah. Okay, yes, yes. I noticed that when we were looking for the total n, there was one with l, there was one, the first one, l capital L over d raised to the power three. And there is another L over D 
risk bar one. So I was yeah. wondering that is it a different? Is it a different? Does it represent a different thing or is the same? Or can it be put together as risk bar four? Yes. Or there is yes, a reason it why it's the same. Mm. No, it's the same. It can it can be raised to the power four, but this is mostly if to, to do the comparison without time of line and with time of light. So the first one raised to the power of three corresponds to the number of voxels. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> so this corresponds to the number of voxels in the volume. And this corresponds to the number of voxels along one line through the volume. So that is the number of voxels on which you're going to uh, do the back projection. And that's the number of voxels into the volume. So the total statistics is a statistics of one voxels multiplied by the number of voxels multiplied by the number of voxels you have in each projection line, in every okay. projection line. This is why you get this actually to the power of four. Okay, and this so. is the reason that if you want to keep the same signal to noise ratio, but improve the spatial resolution by a factor two, let's say have smaller D by, by a factor two. If you want to have the same A over delta, delta A, you need to, sorry, you need to uh, increase N by a factor 16, mm -hmm. right? So when you are measuring time of flight, this last element here is no more the number of voxels along the line, but only a small part of it. Only those around the position of the annihilation, plus or minus the error. And this is there that you are going to gain on the signal to noise ratio. OK, sir. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. OK. Maybe um, other questions? If there is a hand raised by Yaya. Uh, uh, please go ahead, yeah, yeah. For some reason, thanks, I Steve. Uh, sure. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, uh, Christian, for your interesting presentation. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. You mentioned you mentioned employing these techniques for the monitoring of radio of proton therapy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what. Could you develop a little bit more? And my second question, is it possible to measure those deposit uh, at the scale of picosecond, for example? Will it be possible uh, to put a detector which give us the dosy the deposited dose in fast, uh, fast time to measure those also? Uh, for, for, for those measurements, very fast detectors that are now studied corresponds to, to diamond detectors, detectors in diamonds, in uh, artificial diamonds, because these are semiconductors that are really very, very fast. Uh, so maybe you should look to, to, to this direction with diamond detectors for uh, doing dosimetry. Uh, going back to proton therapy, when you, you have a proton uh, irradiation, you know that the proton is mostly delivering his energy into the Bragg peak, right? Yeah, yeah, you know what is the Bragg yes. peak? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, I know. Okay, so, uh, and, and during this dose deposition, there are uh, inelastic collisions with, with the nucleus. And resulting from that, you have plenty of uh, secondary particles that are created. You, you will find activations by neutrons, you will find neutrons, you will find Bremsstrahlung, but also you will find prompt gamma emission. So if you are able to image this prompt gamma, 
uh, by using some kind of uh, electronic collimation, you, you will be able to, to build up, uh, to measure the range of the proton because you, are, you will have a strong accumulation of uh, prompt gamma emission at the range position in the Bragg peak, right? So um, basically what you are using for, for measuring this prompt gamma, one idea is to use a Compton camera. And as you know, a Compton camera uh, which is the Compton interaction of the prompt gamma ray into uh, uh, a scatter detector. And then uh, the measurement of the uh, scattered photon energy into an absorber detector. And the information you get out of this is what we call the electronic collimation you can get out of this is that the, the, the prompt gamma uh, is lying on a cone which is defined by the energy measurement of the uh, Compton electron and of uh, the scattered photon. And so you know from that the, the angle of the cone and from the interaction point of the uh, scattered photon into the absorber and of the Compton interaction, you have the axis of the cone. So that cone will, will cut will intercept with the, the beam trajectory in two points. These two points are the two possible points where the prompt gamma ray was coming. So this is typically what we call the line cone reconstruction of prompt gamma rays in, in hadron therapy. Now, if you are able to measure with high precision the time of detection of the prompt gamma and the going of the protons through uh, a beam hodoscope, this time difference will allow you to, uh, uh, to discriminate between the two points and know which one is the right one. Okay. So this is a bit okay. complicated, but I, I, can, I can go even further on. Let's say if, imagine this is not true, but this is the, the same idea. Imagine the proton will travel at the speed of light. Actually, the proton beam is, a, is traveling only at about two thirds of the speed of light. But imagine it would travel at the same speed as the speed of light. Then if you will, you will be able to detect precisely the time the proton goes through a beam of the scope, and then the time of detection in a pixel of the prompt gamma. Then you could determine uh, the, the path length of uh, a segment of two, two parts, which is given by the difference of time detection uh, divided by the speed of light, right? And these lengths here will form with the position of the other scope and the position of the pixel that detects the prompt gamma, uh, a kind of rope with which you can find, you can uh, draw an ellipsis where the hodoscope and the detector are the two foresee of the ellipsis. And the ellipsis will cut the proton tra trajectory uh, at the, uh, the range position of the proton. So there are plenty of applications of fast timing which are related to range measurements through the prompt gamma imaging. I know it's, it's a bit complicated, especially without um, being able to draw something, but uh, this is the idea. Okay, other questions? Um, if not, uh, I think it's time to thank uh, Christian again for this uh, very nice lecture. Um, and um, so um, emails will be sent for the, for the next, uh, as reminder for the next uh, lectures. Uh, so Ketevi has recorded this lecture as usual. So the, um, uh, this recording will be uh, uploaded to the Indico page that you can uh, go and look again um, afterwards.
So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for connecting. Thank you, Christian, for this uh, nice lecture. And uh, see you uh, next week. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.